Hello, welcome to another episode of On The Payroll, my podcast about project management, project delivery, leadership, salesforce, consulting, all the things that, all the topics that really, really interest me. And it's great because I get to talk to people who are fascinated by the same things as well. In today's episode, actually today is quite an exciting one for me because um, in this episode I speak to Tom Bassett and he is someone who truly gives back to the community, to the Salesforce Ohana by providing answers to a lot of aspiring um, architects and developers who are looking to improve. But not only that, but he contributes articles to Salesforce Ben and this thing that is making me excited um, is that he used to work for Samaritans and um, those who know me know that I am a volunteer and so I'm a user of the call logging system that's built on Salesforce and I get to ask him a lot of questions that interested me as a user because when I've got the phone when I'm on the phones, I'm on the other side. I'm the user. I'm not the one who designed the system. So being able to ask somebody who's actually built it in terms of what they thought about and how they thought about approaching things that were crucial to the value system of the organization was very interesting to me. Not only that, but I wanted to know what made Samaritans different from other nonprofits because a lot of uh, not-for-profits and charities have unique challenges that are different from the corporate world and it was really interesting to hear that the one that helped the Salesforce implementation at Samaritans succeed was because of active listening. But don't let me steal the thunder, I hope you will listen to this and enjoy this as much as I obviously did and you can tell. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Thank you so much for making the time to come on my podcast today um, on the payroll, where I talk about anything ranging from uh, consulting, Salesforce leadership. And today I'm so excited to have you. We'll dive into why that's so. How, How are you today, Tom? Yeah, I'm good. Good, thank you. Really excited to be here and looking forward to sharing some of my tidbits with you. Fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the part of your career where you were Samaritans. But uh, before we get there, I would love to hear you tell the story of how you get to, how you've got to where you are today. So tell me your story. Begin wherever you like. Yeah, sure. So my Salesforce story as such does start at Samaritans and we'll probably, we'll come back to this, but my my career in Salesforce started, I believe it's 2018, um, as a Salesforce admin for Samaritans. And ultimately I got to a point where I wanted to develop within Salesforce. I wanted to learn new skills and kind of spread my Salesforce wings. Um, And so from there, I then moved into a consulting role and I'm now in my third uh, consulting position. Uh, So I have a a breadth of experience over kind of sales service experience, clouds, uh, sprinkling of um, field service, CPQ knowledge in amongst that too. And also one of my favorite clouds, Pardot. So I, I, I have quite a lot of broad experience um, in, in various different things. You, you may have seen me um, contributing as part of the Answers community or the Trailblazer community as it's now known. Um, and also I do some regular articles as well as part of Salesforce Ben 2. So I'm definitely one for sharing my, my wisdom and helping others and I spend quite a lot of my own time doing that too. What is it about Salesforce that I can see that you're really into it so much so that (laughs) you're giving your own time to do all these extra over and above. Uh, Tell me about what is it about Salesforce that attracts you so much? 
Yeah, I think just as a as a platform, as a system, obviously it's one of the market leaders there. There's three releases a year, so there's always new things to learn, new features coming, maybe new entire clouds coming as well. And the Salesforce family of products, as you know, kind of continues to grow. So with the recent acquisition of Slack and then historic acquisitions of Tableau and, and other tools too, it's just exciting to kind of have that diverse knowledge and also the thing that I really enjoy about the Salesforce community and it as a platform is ultimately helping others be being part of something bigger and actually I might be on the answers community helping somebody in America that I've never met before that our only common ground is that we both use the same system and I can completely make their day by fixing something that isn't working or giving them some pointers or some tips. So like the power of the Salesforce community, I think, is the, the biggest thing that drives me um, to kind of stick and stay with Salesforce. And ultimately, that there's a part of me as well that likes helping others and, and giving back uh, so I can kind of use those things together and ultimately achieve both goals at once by helping in in other words complete strangers ar around the world with, with their salesforce related problems yeah thank you for that can you uh when you told your story you started from when you first encountered salesforce can you take one step backwards tell me about what you did before that and how you got your foothold in the ecosystem because that's something that a lot of people are very keen to do um, as, as we know, Salesforce ha, has put in such a huge investment um, into, in, in, into the system and a lot of people are looking to join the community and so, you know, they get on trailheads, uh, they get their certs, but without mm -hmm. experience, many are finding it quite challenging to, to just, you know, get traction. Yeah. Um, if you can just share with us how you got your first role at Sam's to, you know, um, that, that that might be useful to help people when they're thinking about what to do next and how to approach this. Yeah, no, definitely. So it's interesting, really, because I kind of fell a little bit into a Salesforce role. It wasn't necessarily something that I was planning um, years in advance. My, my background before that was on a service desk. So ultimately somebody would have a problem, they would phone me, I would maybe jump onto their PC remotely, fix the problem and then move on to the next one. So that, that was my background. And ultimately I started to, as part of that role, I did a little bit. So I got a little glimpse of Salesforce admin. So I was suddenly like, I don't know, issuing password resets or helping people that weren't able to log into the system as part of my service desk type role. Um, I was then offered the opportunity to move into kind of a, a Salesforce admin role um, at Samaritans, but also as part of that role, and this was just the, the nature of the role at the time, um, I was also a, a Confluence admin, a, a Jira admin, and a crowd uh, admin as well so uh, I was wearing a Salesforce hat amongst many others but ultimately I think my kind of guidance and and I got quite a lot of support and mentoring and coaching while I was at Samaritans to kind of ease me into the world of Salesforce something that really helped me kind of get my foot in the door um, in particular was the actual admin workshops that Salesforce run. They're, they're now run um, via the Trailhead Academy. So I went on a, a five day workshop um, to ultimately kind of teach me the, the fundamentals. Something else that, that really helped me is I had a great uh, line manager that was able to support me and kind of guide me on my journey, as well as Trailhead too. Um, and I think the whole gamification part of it was quite a big tool uh, and it was quite a driver for me. 
I'm definitely naturally quite a competitive person, right? So as soon as I see points, prizes, badges, whatever it is, I, I'm driven by that. So the, the whole game of it kind of helped me become, become part of it as well. And I was just offered, as I say, quite fortunate to be offered that opportunity as kind of a, a stepping stone into the ecosystem and and do Salesforce admin amongst other systems admin. Um, and then ultimately that led me on the path that I'm, I'm at now where I'm um, a senior consultant and in terms of Salesforce certifications have, um, as of yesterday actually, 20 now. So there, there's quite a lot there and hopefully this this will kind of help people, inspire people to go on similar paths. My my advice for anybody trying to get into the, the ecosystem, um, experience is key, but it, it's kind of like a little bit of a rock and a hard place because without experience, you're not going to be able to get into the role. And without the sign of certification or know-how, you're not going to have the experience. So it's it's quite tricky to start off with. Um, but ultimately, there are programs out there. I know that there are various kind of apprenticeship type roles in the Salesforce ecosystem now. Um, I know super mums do um, a training program too. There's, there's lots of ways in because ultimately, the Salesforce community um, or the, the talent pool is relatively small. So Salesforce are doing everything within their power to encourage people to kind of open up opportunities and um, to help guide people into the types of roles to ultimately plug the, the little kind of skills gap that, that, that there kind of is in the market. Um, yeah, I think that's that's a snippet there of <laughs> my my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that actually leads me quite nicely to ask you some things um, about how Samaritans has done this. Uh, as a listening volunteer, I use the system when I go on my shifts. Uh, I have been a volunteer for about 13 years, starting from a different branch. There was no systems. We had paper that we had to fill in, just key information about the calls, nothing confidential, but key things like um, the state of the call, for example, how distressed the caller was in just a really small brief um, headline about it. And then we, then we had someone I knew whose job was to collect all the stats and total <laughs> things up. Uh, it was it was horrendous uh, as 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 a tool, and when uh, I took a small break, I had some some kids then. Um, I took a small break, and when I came back, I joined a, a different branch. And at that time, eLog, uh, the electronic logging system, had been launched, and that was I thought was amazing. Um, I also participated in the beta testing session. Um, mm -hmm. So that was when I realized, oh, they use Salesforce because I could see the URL. <laughs> uh, that was when I knew when I thought, oh, you know, they've chosen a great tool for this. Uh, since then, there were quite a few initiatives and I am very impressed from a user point of view, you know, having rolled out many systems of how they have managed a lot of things. but. Uh, I only know it from, from one angle. Uh, I'd love to hear it from your side. Obviously, you can only talk about what's um, more or less knowledge that's in the public domain with regards to case studies or things that um, public can know if they do their uh -huh. digging. So yeah. I, I would love to hear uh, about how you've seen things. How did, it, how did they do things that were done well and what were the core guiding principles when they're thinking about rolling out changes in um, things to the branches? Yeah, no, sure. So I'll start off on the, the e-log side and maybe 
I give a little bit of an explanation in terms of what Samaritans does and, and what it offers, because there might be some people listening that might not necessarily know that. So ultimately, Samaritans is there to listen to anybody that, that calls the, the helpline and ultimately offer kind of emotional support as such. Um, they have various different channels of this. So uh, the main channel is the um, national number 116123. Um, and there are also email channels and SMS channels too. Um, ultimately, what Samaritans did um, is ultimately they identified a need for a central logging tool because historically as as you described there there were people in one of the 200 plus samaritans branches floating around with bits of paper and ultimately tallying all of these pieces of paper together to get some kind of statistics to understand what callers are discussing in terms of kind of broad general terms obviously something that's at the core and heart of Samaritans is confidentiality. So that is a, a major factor too it, in a system. The system has to be secure. It has to store information in kind of a general way, not necessarily storing like any specifics about people. Um, so that that was the, the first challenge that was kind of solved with a, a Salesforce type solution. And actually, as I started at Samaritans, and this was actually on the service desk then, they were just um, implementing the e-log, um, which literally stands for electronic log. And ultimately, it, it was quite a big undertaking because Samaritans as an organization is ultimately run by volunteers. There are staff, um and the staff drive the the systems and the central vision but samaritans wouldn't be where it's at today without those twenty thousand volunteers that are sat in branches across the country um ultimately helping callers and supporting those that need that type of emotional support so the the main challenge i think with the implementation just from a Samaritan's point of view was firstly it was building a system that was kind of self-explanatory or straightforward it was also trying to implement a system where if possible things were automated or integrated with with other systems and there were also quite a few needs there for accessibility too. So the, the nature of, I guess, um, large portion of the Samaritans volunteers are part of the older population. And as a result, some of them have particular accessibility needs. So there, there might be volunteers out there that are using a screen reader or other tools that the system needs to contend with and ultimately needs to support. So that was quite a, an important aspect of that. And also as, as part of this too, the, the driver was to ultimately automate those reporting metrics that you were describing with those bits of paper flying around everywhere where ultimately at a central level, the, the charity or the, the head office could ultimately see what kind of subjects callers were discussing and ultimately use those valuable statistics to then build case studies or it may be um, support kind of applications for grants or funding or whatever it is, ultimately those figures form quite a large backbone, I believe, of quite of the use cases and the, the internal goings on there um, within the charities too. So it's quite important to get this right. And ultimately um, it was decided to bring 
everything into Salesforce. And the I guess the reasoning was that Salesforce was already in use internally by some of the staff at head office to um, manage other parts of the volunteer or the branch relationship. So, um, for example, complaints and things like that were dealt with but via Salesforce already. So the idea was to ultimately bring everything together in a, in a central place and Salesforce um, will probably refer to it as a, a customer 360 type situation where ultimately there's this essential source of truth. You can see all of your metrics, where volunteers are taking calls. Um, you can capture high level statistics about those calls, such as duration. Um, but bear in mind that actual personal information won't be captured. So the, the phone number, for example, isn't captured. Um, it, it's encrypted. So that type of information is very sensitive. And ultimately, you could then build on that system. And this is exactly what Samaritans did to then offer targeted support to specific callers too. Um, because quite often within every Samaritans branch, there is a volunteer or set of volunteers that are responsible and kind of support callers that may have particular needs. Um, and ultimately a central logging system can help with that by um, following up with those callers as necessary and, and making sure that those needs are, are met. Um, so I guess that's the, the e-log side of things. Um, and I know that since I left Samaritans, they also embarked on other projects too. But I think there's, um, yeah, I think there's, there's quite a lot to unpack there. So do, do you have any questions um, about that? Yeah. Um, how, how were you involved in, in uh, uh, the whole process? Were you sat in workshops? What, what was your involvement? Okay, so for eLog, um, as I say, I was on the service desk when, when that was going in. So I wasn't too involved um, and I was just primarily helping volunteers that were having technical issues or their call stats weren't pulling through properly because there was something wrong with their PC. So from, from an e-log point of view, that was very much my, my involvement. Um, but with other parts of the, the kind of, uh, digital transformation in terms of what's referred to now, I think as the, the branch management tool. I was involved in discussions around that um, and ultimately kind of helping to ascertain the, the needs of the staff and the volunteers and kind of balance those needs to make sure that at the core of everything, we were putting the, the caller at, at the center and forefront of everything we did. So there was always a balance uh, a balancing point between the needs of the staff and the volunteers because quite often they were contradictory um, and so that there was some kind of middle ground there that, that needed to be found. But at the same time, we had to consider the, the human aspect of what we were doing as well. And ultimately we needed to be there to continue to support our callers in the ways that we were. Um, to continue to deliver the service that we've been known for. So there, there was that part of it, but also another part of it that I'm gonna go on a little bit of a separate track about now and <laughs> talk about is the actual change part of it too, because 
ultimately, as you know, like Salesforce has releases three times a year and every Salesforce release, the e-log will go down for, I think there's a 15 minute window or something like that, but it will be unavailable for those 15 minutes. So, and then in addition to that, we kind of had BAU as well in terms of other changes that were happening to the e-log and the volunteers don't even necessarily know that it's powered by Salesforce, it's running by Salesforce because it's not branded as such. It's all under its own persona and different colors and everything. And ultimately, we kind of needed to find a way to effectively communicate with those volunteers to tell them, hey, heads up, e-log is going down for 15 minutes because there's a release um during this time please use the the tools here to record your calls and pop, pop them into the system afterwards and ultimately as well as that we kind of had to ensure and i think this is just a really good best practice in general in, in terms of change management we had to ensure that if something went wrong uh we had a backup plan or we had a rollback. So that's, I think, often maybe in, in organizations like Samaritans, maybe not really thought about as much, but we, we definitely had that because ultimately for us, if the system went wrong, it would impact all of our volunteers who are currently on shift. And as I say, there's, there's 20,000 different volunteers. They do a couple of hour shifts um, at a time and ultimately if you are impacting those volunteers negatively you're going to be indirectly impacting the callers as well so that's why we need to make sure that those communications were were clear um, straightforward and ultimately that it reached the the actual volunteer who was logging on for their shift at the time that they needed it as well. So we will quite often just put something on the login page to just say, look, heads up, e-log is going to be down for these 15 minutes. Um, during that time, refer to this page. Um, and then ultimately, because that, that was a problem as well, maybe a little bit niche to Samaritans, but we would send the messages out via the, the different channels that we had. But quite often they wouldn't necessarily get all the way down to the volunteers that were on the calls at that time. So we, we kind of basically built a mechanism whereby if we needed a, a message that needed, needed to go out and needed to go out urgently, we could just pop that message on the login page and then the volunteer can actually see, oh, it's not working, I'll, I'll use this instead. So that, that was quite a big part of of things too. Thank you for shedding such, you know, just, just bringing so much clarity. Again, as a user of the system, I can see the work that's gone in behind it. And as you say, um, it was so important to bring up any information about system downtime uh, to the volunteers so that the callers don't get impacted. That's, I found it so fascinating. I want to ask you in particular about something you said earlier on that will um, surely inform your next role as a consultant. And as, a, as what, what I'm trying to get at is um, I've also been a consultant for a while. I've done a lot of projects, some corporate, some charity, some local government. And what I've found is the charity sector is very unique Yep. in uh, in how you need to approach them. And you picked up one uh, item, which I'd like to you know tease out a little bit more, which is balancing the need between the staff, the volunteers, and the um, service users, which would be the callers. Can you share your experience and what you learned about that, which I think would have been very helpful for you in any uh, NFP or charity projects that you work on after that. And also for any of the volunteers so that they, not volunteers, sorry, 
any of the audience or anyone listening into the podcast to think about, hey, you know, when when I do a um, NFP or a charity project, and it's key to understand the the difference between the needs that it is that important. So let me just pull back slightly. So some of the charity projects that I've heard of and that I've been on have not been as successful as it could be because uh, there was too much focus on one group over the other. I feel that Sam's has done a re really good job from a from a volunteer point of view. Obviously, mm -hmm. I I I think also from the caller's point of view because basically when we're happy or we can deliver the service well, then our callers. Yep. Um, receive a great service uh, but is there anything anything you can share any learnings around how do you balance that it must be incredibly difficult but because as you say um, sometimes the conflict yeah no there is definitely always those differences of opinion and, and conflicts between what the central charity may need and and what the volunteer actually needs to to get their job done um, I think something that helps Samaritans in particular, and um, unfortunately it's the only kind of charity project or Salesforce related project that I've been on so far, um, is at the core of everything they do. Um, everything that they do is, is basically revolving around the, the theme of actively listening. Right. And this may sound a little bit corny, but the other day when you shared on, on LinkedIn the, the post of the Samaritans listening will, um, I think that that kind of really, really brought it home and summarized it quite well. Because as an organization, they they care. And and the the difference here between a charity and a kind of business or, or another organization that's implementing Salesforce is the goals of the system are going to be different, right? So a, a business might want Salesforce to increase revenue, uh, improve conversion rates, um, deliver a better service. Whereas a charity um, like Samaritans is, is using the tool to ultimately improve the service that they offer to their callers and to enhance the experience of their volunteers and to also as a charity that relies on volunteers to help them recruit more volunteers and to retain volunteers as well so that those metrics are very different um, and as a result they're a kind of they're more what i would describe as human-based metrics rather than money based metrics that you would get with with a traditional implementation and i think the thing that samaritans does really well is as i say actively listen to all of those that are involved involve volunteers at, at different levels and and parts of the process so there are kind of different levels of volunteers you may have senior volunteers you may have kind of deputy directors, regional directors, um, and ultimately it kind of engages them in the right way. And it does truly listen to, to what people are saying. And it sounds corny because like, that's the heart of what Samaritans does. But the reason why they do that as a charity is part of the reason why I think the implementation of, of things such as ELOG have been such a success because they are ultimately there to listen and they are while they're doing that they are juggling the needs of the central charity that might want particular figures to support um, an application for some funding or whatever it is against a volunteer that's on shift and ultimately just wants to be able to log their calls quickly so the volunteer might not want to give the extra information that then supports that funding so there's always a, a middle ground there um and something else and i'm going to go uh, on a different path again but i think something that was quite important 
And this goes back to um, my, my service desk days. We had a internal uh, change advisory board um, referred to quite often in IT as a cab. And I've, I had this in other different service desk roles as well. But ultimately the idea is that any change to the system, whether that's a new feature, a new service, or maybe a bug is being fixed, whatever it is, has to go through that cab. And that cab are formed of different stakeholders and those stakeholders then basically approve or reject the change. And as part of that, and something that Samaritans did very well, is making sure that, as I say, there was a communication plan, there was a back out plan, and the kind of impact was assessed. And if it was a new feature, very important to ultimately make sure that the volunteers know what they were doing, how they're doing it. So if there was any training that needed to be delivered, whatever, ultimately it wouldn't have got through without that having been prepared. So there were very stringent checks to make sure that ultimately, if anything was being implemented, and this wasn't necessarily things just for volunteers, it might have been functionality just for staff, but any kind of system-wide changes went through that internal approval to actually make sure that they kept the show on the road, the, the lights were still running and the, the phones were still ringing and there was volunteers still answering them. So I think that's quite an important part of not only kind of change management, but just like ongoing business as usual as well. Thank you for that. You bring a really, really good point about um, getting the users on board. So as an example, one of the early sales, so my background is Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Dynamics CRM, and one of the sales projects that I was on whereby um, we were streamlining the opportunity management process and there were more fields that the sales team had to put in than they were used to. Um, and the change was not handled well. And so there was a little bit of an uprising and the sales team was going, I don't want to fill in all this information. My key job is to bring in customers. And so there was a lot of resistance. Uh, going back to your point about how Sam has uh, managed all of this. And again, as a volunteer and as a user of the system, they have done a really good job around educating, around why we're doing things this way, how to do it, how to fill in the information effectively, and why it was important um, to do that. And as you say, what's really cool, and you've highlighted that, and even though I knew it, it brought it home in how they have put one central guiding principles around uh, the caller, which was the most important thing. And all the messaging around why we were doing things was in aid of just that one principle. Um, and thank you again earlier on for um, explaining what Sam said in the background around it, uh, where the mission was to reduce suicides by um, actively listening and providing a safe space to our caller and just having that one mission and everyone could get around that. There was no contradicting messaging around why safeguarding, for example, and why we roll out certain things and why it may be two clicks more to do something to collect a piece of information. So uh, what a great, what a great story of how best a charity like Sam's has leveraged Samaritans to, to in aid of their goals. So I thank you very much for indulging me in explaining so much about how the charities use the system. Um, so let's move on from there to your next role, which was consulting. So you move from end user to consulting. Tell me about uh, 
your decision process around it and how you found that shift. Uh, I assume it's quite a big shift for you. Yeah. But I'd love to hear how you found it. Sure, yeah. So as you say, it was, it was quite a jump for me to, to make and decide to make, but I felt comfortable with making it because I was staying kind of in the same area in, in terms of, I wasn't necessarily leaving Salesforce. I was just moving from a an end user role to a consultant role. And the thing that really helped me uh, initially as, as a consultant, I was supported by my peers um, on larger projects um, and ultimately kind of guided and in a way learned through trial and error it, in terms of what I describe as like the art of consulting, right? So there's there's always, and you often find this like in a project in general, but you, you start and you go through a project in various different stages. So you would initially discover, you would then kind of design or and then build and then deploy. And through those stages, your kind of interaction and what you need to get from the customer and how you need to work with the customer kind of varies. At the beginning of, of the project, it's very much about, again, kind of almost going back to that Samaritan's principle, but actively listening to how the customer is describing their business process and then starting to go on to the next project phase of actually okay so i know how they manage their sales and how they get leads through the pipeline but how does that translate into salesforce so something that i'm still learning and, and continue to learn is the art of understanding this is the business problem and this is the system and those two things coming together to then deliver the right solution where we can ultimately meet the project goals. So that was quite a big shift for me um, because before I was just used to supporting callers and, and staff, but now I was kind of supporting more commercial businesses to achieve. So it was some of the success metrics or the key criteria for, for success for these projects were different in terms of, as I say, they want to increase revenue or they want to improve conversion or they want to increase engagement or whatever it is. They were very different metrics. So that was something that I learned quite quickly. And even now, I, I wouldn't say I've got it down to a fine art because as you, as you know, every customer is different and you have to really understand what's important to that customer. And I think something that I've learned quite recently in a little tidbit that I took away from one of the Salesforce exams, it's actually not only understanding the customer, but also being able to then speak in the same terms that the customer is using. So if they refer to um, opportunities as deals or pipeline, then whenever you want to present back to them, you use the phrases that make sense to them so then that they can understand it in their terms. I think that's quite an important rule. Um, and I'm glad that Salesforce include those types of questions in the solution architect exams because I, I think that's something that makes quite a good solution architect and um, the other part of it and this is I think something that kind of would would be a common um, thing with with other consultants too is just about trying to keep up with with what's going on and, and the new features um, and that was definitely a shift um, but ultimately I've kind of plans now um whenever salesforce do a new release or whenever there's something new coming out and i don't necessarily know the answer to it myself 
I'm not afraid to ask my peers. And if my peers don't know, then I'm not afraid to just post it on the community and ask somebody else that uses Salesforce that, that might know the answer. Or maybe sometimes post on the community and actually kind of pester Salesforce directly and say, hey, can you explain what this means? Uh, I've done that a couple of times too. So that there's definitely the kind of using the, the Salesforce community and being part of the Salesforce community um, to kind of progress is uh, super important too. Um, and I, th I think that's something that I've kind of learned to do more and more. I was quite used to, from coming to an admin, I was quite used to kind of just finding solutions by myself and ultimately being given kind of the necessarily time to do that. But definitely as a consultant, there's different time pressures there. You've got project milestones to hit, you've got deadlines to meet, etc. You don't necessarily have all of that spare time to, to do the research. So definitely learning to reach out for help and ask other members of the community for help, I think is, is definitely um, very useful uh, advice. Fantastic. That kind of uh, quite naturally segues to the thing that you were interested to highlight, which is the career path that you took uh, from from yeah, what's called an accidental admin right yeah. up to consulting <laughs> to being a senior consultant and uh, solutions architect. Um, do you want to share what are the learnings that you've had in this journey so that someone who's listening and thinking, ooh, getting to where he is is actually quite difficult. How how would one go about doing it? Does, is it as daunting as a lot of people think? What what can you <laughs> share that would make that feel, oh, I can do that too? <laughs> Apologies, one second. Oh, yeah, so my, my advice for anybody who wants to go along a similar career path something that i learned initially and i think something that's really helped me um is to build upon those core admin foundations so for me the salesforce admin exam um the advanced admin and the app builder exams are the bread and butter of what i do on on a daily basis so I understand uh, the key principles in terms of how to control record access and what profiles are, what permission sets are, what fields are, etc. Because those things and, and having a really good strong foothold into that area will then help you gravitate and kind of then progress into more of the consulting arena because believe it or not, throughout the consultant exams and even some of the architect exams, you'll be going back to those core fundamentals of like how Salesforce controls access, what fields are, what page layouts are, what record types are, whatever it is, that is the bread and butter of everything you do. So my advice for anybody starting out would be to initially start from the admin exam and then consider advanced admin, um, but then definitely go for app builder as well. I just kind of feel like, yeah, it, it is a little bit like a box ticking exercise. Like you go through the admin exams, then you go through the consultant exams like I did, and then you start to go through some of the architect exams, but that is the, the natural progression. I think something that has really improved since, since I started and since um, I've been on that journey myself. Um, Salesforce do quite a lot of certification days now. So they run half day webinars on how to prepare for particular exams. Those are three of charge. And sometimes Salesforce also offer a discounted exam voucher at the end um, as a little bit of an incentive to attend. So th those are really good if you're kind of almost ready, I think, to, to take the exam. And then otherwise, there are lots and lots of different tools, resources out there, in particular on Trailhead, in terms of actually preparing for those exams too. 
So Salesforce break up the learning into different trail mixes and they, within those trail mixes, they are split by exam section as well. So you can ultimately work through that path at a pace that suits you. Um, and also now in particular with, with the admin exams, um, they also provide a set of practice questions that are generally available too. So that's, that's an advantage to anybody that's doing it now, because when I did it, um, the, the only practice questions you could get were on web assessor, which, which you then had to pay for. Um, but now there, there's a set, I think it's about 30 questions that you can just access by a trailhead um, and, and kind of practice those things too. Some other tips, like if you're stuck on anything in particular, feel free to post out on the Trailblazer community because that's what it's there for. It might be me or it could be somebody else that replies. But what I tend to say to people and as I'm helping people and, and coaching people that I work with, I like to kind of think that no question is a silly question. I don't believe in silly questions. And there's no need to apologize for not knowing something. We're, we're always learning. We're always there to learn. I learn a fair amount to this day just by answering questions because I'll actually start digging into a particular feature in Pardot or whatever it is, and then kind of play around in my own developer org and then go back with some kind of solution or suggestion on how to solve the problem. So that's, that's a, another tip bit. There are also the um, community groups that are out there that you can join. And in particular, if you're in the nonprofit sector, there is a, a nonprofit community group that I used to be a member of in um, London. Um, and they used to meet at Salesforce Tower on a, a regular basis. So that's that's definitely another tip. Bit. And it just helps you network with, with like-minded individuals. Um, there is also the potential reaching out again by the Trailblazer community or something similar to kind of form a, an unofficial study group with somebody else. Um, and you can work towards the same goals and kind of use that to, to kind of prepare and, and aim to, to pass your Salesforce exam. And I think those, those are the main points, but something else that I'd just like to add to that is there's quite a jump between the admin exams, the consultant exams and the architect exams. So this another little tidbit for you here is on the admin exams, questions are structured in a, in a certain way and you would usually be able to eliminate some wrong answers by, by looking at the question and thinking, hell wait, that's a made up feature. Like that doesn't exist. I can, I can definitely rule that one out. Um, but when you get to the consulting exam or the, the, those types of exams, the questions are not only more wordy, so the, the questions are longer, there's more to them, but there isn't necessarily just one right answer. There is potentially two right answers, but what Salesforce are looking for, and this is where I come back to the art of consulting again, they're looking for the best practice, the, the easiest way for the fictional company to achieve that and also the most maintainable way as well so something that i tend to apply to those types of situations and it might be an exam but it could also be from like a solution that i'm thinking about too is um and i think uh, i can't even remember who told me this i'm pretty sure it was a salesforce instructor along the way um told me to use the acronym KISS and ultimately what that stands for is keep it simple silly so literally the most like the easiest way to implement something and to then maintain it um, is quite often the simplest 
So why would you do something in code when you can do it using flow? And you can maintain a flow a lot easier than you can maintain an Apex class and a test class. So that's definitely something that Salesforce are looking for in the consultant exams. And then again, when you get as far as the architect ones, there's another step up. And the architect exams are again, longer. Like there's more content every question you'll see sometimes one or two paragraphs per question and you have to select from that the, the right answer so but the fundamentals are the same like the bread and butter of salesforce admin how to achieve things doesn't change and in the ad, uh, in for example one of the architect exams they might be looking for something in terms of the principle of record types and page layouts like they they could be asking about that and ultimately an architect should know that because by the time they've got to that point in in my mind they've gone through all of the admin exams already and possibly the majority of the consultant ones as well so i think those are quite helpful tidbits um i've also written some articles on salesforce ben and just general Salesforce tidbits and there's an article there on flow and there's also another one on digital engagement and if you're aiming towards kind of certifications recently come out the um the advanced admin certification guide uh, I recently wrote and that's up now on Salesforce Ben 2 so definitely use those tools in in your kind of tool belt in, in your arsenal to help you achieve to, to where you want to get to. Amazing. I think I got a lot more than I expected yeah. uh, <laughs> out of this podcast. Uh, how fantastic. You've exceeded my expectation, which is what we should all be doing in the world of consulting. So I want to be mindful of your time. We're slightly over, but it was really, really great stuff. A lot of tips. Uh, and like I said, you indulged me in the explaining so much about the world of Samaritans and how to view Salesforce to um, to just power the platform. So once again, I'd like to thank you so much, Tom, for spending the time with me just to share all your nuggets and your wisdom and information for uh, the, the audience that we have. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for having me.